It's a very good afternoon, Niall Boylan, and uh, just for a special interview today. And I get asked on a regular basis, uh, actually ever since the referendum on abortion, because at the time I wouldn't tell anybody my opinion, because of course I was on radio and I have a duty to be impartial. So I didn't, you know, and I gave equal sides, of course, to the pro and the choice side. Uh, but here's the thing. I've been asked on numerous occasions, Niall, what's your stance on abortion? And I'm going to be honest with you. My stance is I respect democracy. That's my stance on abortion. I morally believe it's wrong, and I morally don't agree with abortion. I'm not a Christian, but I'm probably the most religious atheist you'll ever find. Uh, but I morally think it's wrong. But I would never judge somebody because I can't walk a mile in their shoes. So I would never judge a woman, or if I knew a woman, or a woman told me she had an abortion, I wouldn't cast judgment on her. She made that decision, and she made that decision consciously. Uh, but I don't personally agree with it. Um, but I, the one thing I do respect is democracy. And the majority of the country voted in favour of it. You can argue about the referendum and how it was held and the way the government kind of pushed people into a yes vote with promises, of course, that they would limit it to 12 weeks, that they would allow a three-day cooling off period and all of those other things. And for a lot of people, that's the whole thing, isn't it? Well, okay, I'll accept democracy, provided it's safe. Well, I was quite shocked when I saw a story and it, and it was in Grip Media. And it says, why are the media ignoring the abortion scandal that almost killed a woman? Now, that kind of headline is bad to grab you, isn't it? And this week, Grip broke a shocking story around abortion in Ireland that showed that the woman's lives are being put in danger by uh, the blind and willful determination not to provide ultrasounds when women seek abortion, presenting an alarming and disturbing case where a woman could have died. Medical experts working in Limerick Maternity Hospital said that the practice of not offering ultrasounds before prescribing abortion pills could lead to maternal deaths. Neve E. Brian, uh, Neve e. Brian uh, is an author in Grip Media and she joins me on the line. Neve, good afternoon to you. Hi, Anaya. Nice Neve, you. you couldn't ignore a headline like that because no matter whether you're pro-choice or pro-life, you would have to say to yourself, well, you know, absolutely, we respect democracy, but it must be safe. And this doesn't seem to be safe, does it? Well, here's the thing, now, and maybe I'll talk about the case and then come back to that point you just raised there, which is that it is being ignored. You know, you're not seeing this story on RTE, you're not reading about it in the Irish Times or the Irish Independent. And... We've been told consistently, and we have been told for at least a decade, that you know women's safety is paramount in relation to healthcare, in particular healthcare around abortion, and that in fact we, we, we were told that we should repeal the Eighth Amendment precisely because we were told we needed to do so to keep women safe. Yet we have this case um, that was written up, by the way, in the Irish Medical Journal. This is not, you know, an anecdote. This is not hearsay. This is not somebody sharing information on social yes, media. Yes, it's not a red herring story or something like that. Yeah, I know. Absolutely. Like, this was written up by um, by doctors working in obstetrics and gynecology in Limerick Maternity Hospital. And they wrote up, you, you see this very often in medical journals, where doctors will think that a particular case is so important or that you have so much to learn from a particular case that they write it up in a medical journal where it's peer-reviewed and then it's, it's accepted and it's published. And they wrote, they wrote up about a case of a woman who went for an abortion and she was given abortion pills. And if people think back to 2018, when the abortion law was being put through the door, and probably people didn't follow that closely really. You know, the referendum was over, they were going to, going to legalise abortion, and people didn't follow the ins and outs around the law. But Carol Nolan, the independent TT, TD, put forward a very important amendment to the law, and she asked Simon Harris to put a clause into the legislation, which would ensure that if a woman was having an abortion, and, and she was getting the abortion pill, that she would get an ultrasound before that abortion, okay? And the reason for that is because if you don't have an ultrasound, you can't see where the baby is growing. And in sometimes women have what's called an ectopic pregnancy. And that's where the baby come down, comes down to the fallopian tube. If you think back to your biology, biology class, okay, the sperm hits the egg, and then the egg comes down the fallopian tube and it becomes embedded in the womb where the baby grows. But sometimes, and it's not as rare as you think, right? the baby gets lodged in, in the fallopian tube or somewhere outside the world. And what happens then, as you can imagine, the fallopian tube is quite narrow, right? The baby continues to grow and the fallopian tube bursts. And that, as Dr. Trevor Hayes said, is a life-threatening gynecological emergency. What would happen, sorry, pardon my ignorance, Neve, because as a man, obviously, I don't understand as much as women do, but in a normal pregnancy, in a continued pregnancy, what would happen in those yeah. circumstances in an ectopic pregnancy? What would happen? 
oh, it's always life threatening, always life threatening. Like the fallopian, and before you had, before you had ultrasounds and things like this, okay, very often, suddenly the woman would be in huge pain, they would be bleeding, everything would get worse very fast, do you understand? And we brought to the hospital, it would, it would, it would be an emergency situation. And uh, nowadays what happens is that doctors, of course, have to intervene immediately, they have to remove the tube to save the woman's life, okay? There's no chance the baby can survive this either. Okay. Not the top of so I, that was the point I was making. So generally, the baby won't, yeah. the unborn yeah. baby won't survive that. Yeah. So where the abortion pill complicates matters is this: that in in normal circumstances, if you if your pregnancy is ectopic, okay, and you're at ten or twelve weeks and you haven't haven't had a scan yet, you will start getting abdominal pain and you will start getting vaginal bleeding, and you know there's something wrong, okay? Every woman knows this, and you'll go to the doctor or to the hospital. They'll probably realize very quickly it's ectopic pregnancy. They'll intervene and they save your life, okay? If you've gone and got the abortion pill and you haven't had an ultrasound, okay, this is what Karen Nolan and the doctors were telling Simon Harris in 2018, then it's really easy to confuse the symptoms of the atopic pregnancy, especially before it starts getting worse fast, with the symptoms of taking the abortion pill. Because, because take, I'm assuming taking the abortion pain. pill is essentially just like miscarrying when you take the abortion pill. So a woman could easily confuse, you know, the idea of miscarrying or that what presents itself as miscarrying with what would be happening in a situation where the fallopian tube bursts and you're bleeding. Exactly. So you're getting ab abdominal pain and you're getting bleeding, okay? And you're thinking, okay, I was told to expect this perhaps with the abortion pill. And very often, of course, women, and women share these stories amongst themselves and on internet forums, they have found that, the, you know, the pain and the bleeding after taking the abortion pill was a lot worse than they expected, right? So the woman, would, in this case, undoubtedly, and this is what medics have said to me, would have just thought this is part of the process with the abortion pill. She ends up being rushed to hospital in, in an ambulance. They have to resuscitate her. Yeah, you know, her life is in danger and they managed to save her life in, 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 in the maternity hospital in Limerick. But of course, the reason why the doctors are writing up this case is they're ringing a loud alarm bell to the government. And they're very clear about this. And people can look up this case in the Irish Medical Journal. It's linked in the good story. They're very clear. They put it at the top of the case study. They want people to hear this message. They say that if this routine practice where women do not get an ultrasound before being given abortion pills continues, if that continues, then you're going to see women dying. They said you're going to see mortality. See, now, the, see those who would be against dying. you, Neve, I, sorry, just to interrupt you. The, those who are against you, of course, and, and you are pro-life and, and you've said that many occasions before, but those who are against you will say, well, this is just the pro-life movement looking for a reason to give women an ultrasound so that when the doctor gives the woman an ultrasound before, you know, thinking about having an abortion, that she might change her mind. And and that's what they, they'll say to, to the argument, although I see a very good argument for what you're saying because we don't want women's lives to be in danger, but they will see some sort of yeah. other meaning or other plan by pro-life, you know, in relation to this particular amendment to the law. Yeah. Well, you see, I don't think it matters that I'm pro-life and I don't think it matters what the stance of the doctors who wrote up in that case in the Irish Medical Journal. They probably don't have a public stance and probably yeah. maybe some of them are pro-life and some of them are absolutely in favour of legalised abortion, right? So, I mean, the abortions have been performed in maternity hospitals now, so it's not the case you've got all these pro-life doctors writing, writing articles in medical journals. What they're concerned with is women's sleep. And they are saying, if you continue with this practice where you're not getting ultrasounds before women take the abortion pill, you're putting women's lives in danger. And we had, I talked to Trevor Hayes, who's a, a people, people might know, he's a consultant obstetrician gynecologist in Kilkenny Hospital, a very well respected senior medic. And he said it's now paramount, that's the word he used, paramount for the Minister for Health to intervene and to change this problem. But do you really think that's going to happen? When, you got, when you've got a minister at the moment, you know, listening to lobby groups who are not only who don't agree with you and don't agree with that. They also want to remove the three-day waiting period. They want to extend from 12 to 24 weeks or even further if they had their way. You know, and they're basically trying to loosen up the laws rather than tighten the laws. I mean, it's unfortunate, and I think you're absolutely right because nobody wants to see women's lives being put in danger, no matter how rare it might actually be, but they don't want to see women's lives in danger. The chances of them doing this are probably very slim. Well, I would have agreed with you, I think, Niall, a month ago. And I think something happened on March the 8th that was like a political earthquake for government and for 
and for the opposition for Sinn Féin as well, you know, who are very supportive of liberalising these laws and who be very opposed. Like Sinn Féin were up there with Simon Harris and Stephen Donnelly in the Dáil in 2018 when Carol Nolan was offering this very reasonable and sensible amendment which was backed by nurses and doctors. And like they savaged her, you know what I mean? They tore into her, it was a really nasty ultra debate and they insisted, you know, you just want to do this because you want women to, to have an ultrasound, you want them to see maybe the baby's heartbeat. Yeah, and become all maternal. Yeah, the yeah. What would be wrong with that anyway? But in any case, yeah, they're not saying that now. These are doctors in limited maternity hospital who are sent. They're ringing a bell line. They're ringing a loud alarm bell to the government saying, if you don't do something, women women's lives are in danger and they're going to die. But last, I think you're correct. Like if this was January and this case is written up and we were talking about it here now and the media were doing their best to ignore it, you're probably correct that, you know, Harris and the rest of them would just say, yeah, we can do whatever we want. But on March the 8th, it was a political earthquake in this country when the government realised that they are listening exclusively to NGOs who are telling them this is what the people want. The people want to take mother out of the constitution. The people want an even more liberal abortion law. And there's no basis for any of this. You know, we're in a situation where the abortion rates are, have gone through the roof. Almost 10,000, it looks like now, in 2023. And there's a great wow. many people, I think, who voted yes, who, or who are deeply uncomfortable with that. But well, we, we were told at the numbers. time, we were told by those who advocated for the time that it wouldn't increase the numbers. The numbers at the time were a little over 3,000. Now we have tripled those uh, yeah. those numbers, so we've gone up by, so quite substantially, uh, which really makes a liar out of those people who kind of advocated for it at the time. But, but I mean, what has the minister's reaction been? I mean, Stephen Donnelly, is he aware of this? Yeah, so Steve, Fatima Gunning, who's my colleague in Whipped Media, she's in one of the people working and kind of investigating this case and she wrote to Simon Harris was Minister for Health of course in 2018 and he said it would be a waste of scarce resources to provide ultrasounds for women who are having abortions but now you have like these very senior doctors you have consultant obstetrician like Trevor Hayes you have nurses and midwives for life coming out and saying look we're telling you you're endangering women's lives you don't act on this he's now T-ship of course or T-ship in waiting Simon mm. Harris is and Stephen Donnelly is Minister for Health and I think that what's really important is that this case that no cover-up happens now that we don't allow this case to be covered up and life moves on and the next thing we're looking at a case where the medics perhaps can't intervene well, well, I mean, well, the very the very reason we have abortion, well, the very reason we have abortion nowadays is because campaigners, of course, campaigned from the moment and the day that Savita sadly passed away, uh, which was a woman whose lives were, whose life was put in danger at the time, or so they claimed was put in danger and sadly died and passed away. And that's the very reason that we have the abortion referendum, the very reason that we have abortion laws in Ireland right at this time. So there's no reason that, reason that a similar case, you know, where you have a woman who nearly lost her life, and as you say, it's only a matter of time before maybe a woman does lose her life. And even then, it doesn't seem to be getting the attention that got. So it, it, it does seem a little bit one-sided, doesn't it, from that point of view, the media? Well, it absolutely does. And the medics I'm speaking to are, have said this. They've said that if we ignore this, if we ignore this, if we allow this situation to continue with the ultrasounds aren't carried out, it is just a matter of time before a woman dies. And that will be then. You know, that the, book has to, the book has to stop somewhere, doesn't it, now? Simon Harris has been um, made aware of this situation. Stephen Donnelly has been made aware of this situation. Um, I know that pro-life groups are, con are contacting every TD in Dáil Éireann to say to them, have you read this case in the Irish Medical Journal? Are you cognizant of it? Are you doing something about it to make sure that women don't die because the law must change, absolutely has to change? And like really, um, like the responsibility is on the government, isn't it? The, the promised abortion would be safe, legal and rare. They got where completely wrong. You know, the numbers have tripled. The numbers are compared to three thousand women who have travelled. Now we're looking at ten thousand abortions. They don't seem interested in safety, in women's safety. You know, when we're when we're reading a case, and the, the, when you actually read the case, is very distressing. Like as someone who's had babies, the thought of like presenting at a, at a maternity hospital, you're bleeding, you need to be resuscitated, you're in hypovolemic shock. Like it's enormously scary prospect that women, increasing numbers of women, would be in that situation in Ireland's maternal healthcare system because the government simply won't act on this. And Niall, the reason they won't act, you, you're completely spot on about that too, is because it's not a medical reason. This is what Trevor Hayes, the obstetrician said. He said that their decision not to allow ultrasounds 
wasn't um, political, wasn't medical, it was political. You know, so that they don't want to do it because they think it's something a lot of people might want. Or the mother might give the heartbeat and that might... Might discourage her from having an abortion. Abortion. Yes. Yeah, because of course when women hear the heartbeat, they become maternal, I suppose. Yeah. 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 Heaven forbid. They're brushing women's safety aside for a political reason and that is absolutely unacceptable. And, and where and where do we stand now? I mean, there was an awful lot of debate last year, uh, particularly from people before Profit and other smaller parties, Social mm-hmm. Democrats as well, in relation to removing the three-day wait period, in relation to extending the 12 weeks to 24 or beyond. <coughs> Actually, they wanted to decriminalise completely, uh, which essentially means mm-hmm. that a doctor could have f- perform abortion up the day before they're born. Where do we stand now? And I know Michal Martin at, at the time, or was it Leo Radke, I can't remember, said they wouldn't be dealing with that right now. But where do we stand on that? Are they still pushing for that? Is that likely to happen, that we're going to liberalise the already extremely liberal abortion laws we have in this country even further? Well, you see, I think Breed Smith, um, most people know, is uh, I think a lot of people would imagine Breed Smith is very far on the left. You know, So they would think if she brings forward a bill to the door, it's not going to get the support of the majority of TDs there. But what we saw last year was that Sinn Féin TDs, who of course always vote on block for everything, they know there's never anyone stepping out of line with Sinn Féin. All of the Sinn Féin TDs and some other TDs, like Verona Murphy's Independent, like Neil Richmond of Fianna Gael, voted in favour of Reed Smith's bill, which means it's passed on to the next, next stage. And that bill would legalise abortion on demand to six months. Now, I think a lot of people would find out absolutely well, you, I, I think the, fe- I think the general public would feel a little bit duped, to be honest with you, because I remember at the time when we discussed it on a nightly or daily basis when I was doing the radio show at that, that particular time in relation to abortion, the majority of people who are even on the fence, who sat on the fence, which were probably about a third of the population who sat on the fence in the middle somewhere, they were kind of swayed by the fact that, okay, there's restrictions here. You know, there's a three-day cooling off period. There's 12 weeks, no more than that. And a lot of them, by the way, also kind of felt they were duped because they kind of thought it was just an emergency situation. I spoke to one guy in the air after the event and after the result came out, and he said, I said, did you vote yes or no? And he said, I voted yes. And he said, I said, why? And he said, I voted yes because I wouldn't like to see a woman's life in danger or if she was raped or had a fatal fetal abnormality. I said, that's not what you voted for. And he said, isn't it? So I, I think there was a lot of people would feel greatly duped if we liberalise those laws even further. And I believe that should have to go back to referendum again if they're going to change legislation. Yeah. Now, Reed Smith's bill might sink. If a government, if a general election is called before it comes back, and it probably will. But I think what's interesting is, 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 is that parties like Sinn Féin, and people like Neil Brendan in March of this year. They were, they're listening exclusively like to the National Women's Council, you know, to groups like this. Well, we know, we, we know their credibility is in tatters at the moment. Uh, yeah, well, their credibility is in tatters at the moment after <laughs> the last referendum. Really tatters, yeah. So, I mean, I don't know it whether is, they listen to them. That's who, that's who was listening to. That's who TDs were listening to right up until a couple of weeks ago. You know, so they're, they, and because, if you're only listening to people in this little bubble, Niall, you know, you you will believe, okay, maybe people want to scrap the three-day wait. Maybe nobody wants an ultrasound. Maybe nobody cares that women nearly die because you're not given an ultrasound before an abortion pill. I think that's that, 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 that if you like, the political situation has, has undergone a bit of an earthquake since March. That doesn't mean that I think these vital, really important changes in relation to the ultrasound, that won't happen without, you know, pro-life doctors and nurses raising up your mm. voices, without people making a fuss about this to ensure that women are protected. Must be done. Absolutely has to be done. Well, listen, thank you very much indeed for drawing attention. The article, by the way, is in Grip Media, if you want to read it there. Neve wrote the article herself, and it's called Why Are the Media Ignoring the Abortion Scandal That Almost Killed a Woman? And you can read all the details, the shocking details, about ectopic pregnancies there and how that can affect a woman if she doesn't have an ultrasound. And the warning is, of course, don't be using abortion pills unless you get an ultrasound, uh, because from what Neve and other experts are saying, it can be quite dangerous on those rare occasions that you could have an ectopic pregnancy. Just Neve, just out of curiosity, how, what is the percentage of pregnancies that are ectopic? Do you know? Is it a small? Yes, but, I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I, even if it's only one in a thousand, it's still too much. But what, what are the percentages? No, it's actually, it, it actually occurs because, you know, like yourself, Niall, I was kind of thinking it was at one in every 500. It's not. It, according to the most recent numbers, it's about one in every 80. So if wow. you get 8,000 abortions, yeah, if wow. you can get 8,000 okay. abortions, it could be, a, that this danger could be arising in 100 cases every single year. You know, if, if and, and, and of course, as the abortion numbers go up, um, 
that risk. The more likely that is to happen, absolutely. Uh, you face that risk in case even further. So it's, it's not like a tiny, it's, it is, when we're thinking of rare, we're thinking, it, you know, it doesn't happen in one in every 10, it doesn't happen in one in every 20. But what about the 80 is a pretty high number. And Trevor is, Hayes yeah. was explaining to that, because women are having babies later, things like that, all of these things kind of impact on your likelihood of having an ectopic pregnancy. So it's a real, a real and present danger. That's the kind of risk we're looking at right now. And it, as I said, like those medics, they wrote that paper for a reason. They wrote the paper so that the government would pay attention, you know, and that women's lives would not be endangered by this willful kind of determination never to give an inch, you know, towards the humanity of the baby, never to do anything that might show women that this is a, a baby that they're carrying. And they're, they're so, they're, their sole focus, I think, seems to be on that and on ease of access in relation to abortion. And they're even sweeping aside the considerations that they should be taking into account to protect women's safety. And to me, that's really... I, 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 I personally, but I, I find it quite shocking in Ireland that we have moved from a, a country who cared so much about the unborn child and then of course that Supreme case which based the Supreme Court case which said the child the unborn had no rights which they ran before the referendum um, I just find it shocking that we have moved to that attitude that we kind of don't seem to care as much as we used to about the unborn child but mind you what I always found fascinating was that I had a girl on the air in the studio with me during the abortion referendum and she was uh, pro-choice and she kept referring to the, the unborn child as a fetus or a clump of cells or and all the terminology. And, and by the way, I know there's terminology on both sides of the argument. I hear pro-life people calling people murderers every now and again. So there, there's terminology that's used, you know, triggering terminology. And But she kept using this and then she even called it a zygote at one stage. And I remember about a year and a half later, two years later maybe, she was out campaigning. Of course, she was one of the lead campaigners. And two years later on her Facebook page, I spotted a little baby scan. Uh, she was pregnant and I was delighted for her and she put the scan up and she says here's the first picture of my new baby and I went that's quite ironic isn't it that you're, you're now calling oh, it your baby <laughs> but it wasn't yeah, a baby it's it was so a clump of cells exactly. two years ago it's only a baby if you want it it seems no, that's anyway. it. And I, yeah because I think we touched now there on you know the, the fact that women very often find like leaving aside a top of pregnancy in this particular case and um, women I said anecdotally, and funnily enough, the abortion rights campaign actually did include this in their report around the provision of abortion in Ireland, that very often when women do take the abortion pills, A, it's, it's more frightening for them in terms of bleeding, in terms of pain, much more an intense and an experience, I think, than they thought it would be. But of course, what, we, we, what we've learned from other stories is that very often they get a huge fright too when they see when they see mm. their baby, you know, because your body yeah. expels the baby after taking the abortion pills. And even though sometimes it might only be like a, a 10 or 11 week old, the baby is shocked, really shocked when they see how fully formed the baby I can is. Imagine. How you yeah. the baby is terribly upsetting. And, you know, until very recently, the HSC had up on its website the advice that you should flush what they call the pregnancy remains down the toilet. And I just think there's no respect for the mother or the baby they're not. You know what I mean? There's no real... Even you saying that actually is quite upsetting to listen. Now, I know what happens and, I, and that's just life, you know. And again, yeah. I say I respect democracy. Yeah. But even you saying that, you know, to flush it down yeah. the toilet, you're literally flushing your life down the toilet. I mean, yeah. it is it, for, for a lot of people, maybe that's a realisation. Uh, but listen, thank you very much indeed, uh, Nevi Breen. Thank you for joining I us today and, and raising the issue. It's interesting, I was watching a story in the United Kingdom where a teacher, similar to the Enoch, book sto Enoch Burke story in Ireland or only recently, where Enoch, of course, found himself in court after he'd been suspended for misgendering a student or for refusing to misgender or gender a student or say or use the, the student's identity. Now, as you know, the Enoch Burke case is a little bit more complicated in the fact that he's in jail at the moment. A lot of people believe he's in jail for misgendering. He's not in jail for misgendering. He's, a mis he's in jail for not obeying the order of the court. And you've got to give him 10 out of 10 for perseverance. But a slightly different story to that is in the United Kingdom, we have a similar situation where a teacher, Kevin Lister, um, refused to use the gender identity of a student uh, who, for the purpose of the conversation, is known as pupil A. And pupil A wanted to be referred to as a male, although pupil A was born female. And the teacher refused to do so. He joins me on the line. Kevin Lister, good afternoon to you. Uh, Kevin, where did this? Let's go back to the very start of all this. I mean, when I say the student, the student is not a very young student. Student is seventeen years of age, pupil A. So, when were you first aware that pupil A had changed their identity or wanted to be known as a different identity? So, student A sent me um, a message on Teams 
on the 3rd of September 2021. So immediately coming back um, to, to, to college after the summer break. So it was a short sort of two line message saying, uh, I would like to be known as her new name. Um, can you change the one note um, to reflect that? So I did. Um, and that, that was basically all I had from, and she said um, that um, everybody else in the class knows, so it'd be uh, useful yeah. if you did the same as well. And um, I thought to myself, whoa, you know, that's, um, you know, st you know strict. Straight um, off, wait, I mean, you, by the way, were you taken back by that? I mean, because you would be familiar uh, yeah, with the students. Yes, I mean, completely. yeah. So yeah, you had no idea that. up to that point. No idea that this was coming. Absolutely, just you know, I just you know, just shocked by it. Yeah. So the um, immediate thing I did was to raise a safeguarding concern. Um, there was a big, heavy pro-trans um, ideology and philosophy in, in the in the college, and it was a, an issue much talked about in the staff room. Um, about how we should um, affirm students and use wrong pronouns and so forth. So, but it hadn't happened to me yet at that point. I'd only been in the college for a year at, the, at that point. So I was kind of, sort of still learning the ropes of, of what the culture was. So the immediate thing I did was to raise a safeguarding concern. And I asked three questions. I said, um, do we have parental consent? Is she making an informed decision? And is there a risk that she'll self-medicate with, um, with testosterone? And I also referred to the Kira Bell case. I said, in light of the Kira Bell case, um, you know, we need to consider this carefully and um, also consider it in terms of her um, current academic progress and concerns about her academic progress. So it goes to safeguarding. And then um, I went down to safeguarding to check that they had the concern and it wasn't going to fall through a crack. And then... Um, and then went down on the 7th of February, a couple of days after, four days afterwards, to, to ask what the outcome was and, and what the what safeguarding's plan was. So I expected to hear something like, you know, we're going to do a proper safeguarding investigation, we'll have a safeguarding strategy meeting and so, and so on and so forth. But what they said is the college strategy is not to tell the parents. Wow. I said, you, you've got to be kidding me. OK, and so the student is still a minor. To clarify, the student is still exactly. passed the legally as a minor. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so everyone says that, um, oh, she's 17, that, you know, therefore she can have medical consent. Well, no, she's 17. That means she is a child. And this is not a medical treatment. This is effectively like a, you know, a large scale to two. This is a you know, cosmetic surgery kind of, kind of thing. You, know, you, you, you don't put children into, in for cosmetic surgery in the same way you shouldn't put them in, in for this. So... Um, I'm, by the way, just, just to interrupt you, I, I assume that if a student comes to you with a problem, I'm not a familiar, obviously, I'm not a teacher, but I'm assuming when a student comes to you with a problem, be it, say, mental health problem or depression or or a share something you may be, you know, they may be suicidal or whatever, you have a duty and a responsibility, A, not only to report that to the school, uh, but also a duty and a responsibility to make sure the parents are aware if indeed they are a minor. I'm assuming that would be normal procedure. Exactly. Yeah. So, and, and that's effectively what, what's applying here. You know, student does something completely out of the blue. I raise the safeguarding concern. Do we have parental consent? Um, and, the, and the college position is, no, we're not going to tell the parent. Oh, yeah. So I have a stand up row with the, with the safeguarding. I said, you can't possibly do, do this. Um, you know, we've got to treat this as a proper safeguarding concern. We've got to inform the parents. Uh, and I said to safeguarding, do you know the answer to question two and three? Is she making an informed decision? And is there a risk she'll take cross-sex hormones it would buy self-medication? She said, no, we don't know that. Uh, and and uh, you know, I explained to her um, the risk, the, um, you know, the danger of taking testosterone, because I got myself fairly well up to speed on that. There was also a Swedish study in 2010. It was the best study at the time on transgender outcomes. And it shows that the rate of suicide of female to male transitioners is 40 times greater than the control groups, four zero times greater. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I was explaining to her that there is a massive increase in suicide risk. And, when, and when, you were, when you were talking to the student and explaining this to, to the student, was that a conversation, a reasonable conversation? Did it get heated so, at any so, stage? So, so I, at this time, I hadn't spoken to oh, the okay. student at okay. all. So, so, so the message comes, I immediately raise a safeguarding concern. So safeguarding say, you know, their policy is not to tell the parents. In the meantime, they've, they've had a conversation with the student and they basically, you know, the, the safeguarding response was, are you OK? You know, you, are, they, you know, are you OK with the drugs? And the student says, I don't have any problem with the drugs. Well, I don't know what that means. Does that mean she's got tons of them? You know, does that mean she's getting them from her friends in the college? No idea whatsoever. Or online. The safeguarding, yeah. 
the, the safeguarding response was to tell the student how to change a name on the college system and to tell the student how to go about changing her gender on the college system. So basically, the safeguarding response was to encourage the social transitioning of the student, the very thing I'm concerned about in the safeguarding referral. So at what point were the parents consulted or were they consulted at any stage? Well, 21st of February, when I was um, suspended, um, the court the, in the um, document... But, but I, sorry, sorry, I don't want to skip over that. What led to your suspension? Now, there was a story, of course, that you had put up on the whiteboard on the wall in relation to a maths exam that you had put her in the girls' section rather than the boys' section or, no, it, you, ha or no. you had dead-named her. It, it, was that true or did, was that, was yeah, that yeah. something that you did? So, so, yeah, so we had a girls' maths competition. So after I'd made the safeguarding concern, I hadn't spoken to the student and had no direction from safeguarding other than to say that they're not going to tell the parent. They hadn't actually told me that I had to refer to her with a new name and a new gender and, and so forth. So, so there was a, 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 um, a, mass, a mass Olympia specifically set up for girls to encourage to girls to, 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 to take mass STEM type careers. So I'm encouraging all the girls in the class to enter the competition. And there's, there's uh, four girls in the class and they're all being a bit reticent. So I said, okay, you know, write the names up on the board to, you know, to encourage them. If one name's up, another one will put a name forward. And bit by bit, you know, the, the names um, of the students um, come forward and I, and I write them on the board as a way of encouraging everybody to, to engage. And it's my job as a maths teacher to encourage students to do maths. Anyway, student A at the back of the class, um, once most of the names are up, says, can I still do this? And I thought, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was a provocative question, trying to make a point to everybody else in the class. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, of course you can, because you're a girl. So I wrote her, her girl's name up because it's a girl's mass competition that she's asking if she can still go into. But that apparently was being harassing and discriminating. Okay. I, and this is the reason why. Was that the final kind of straw, as far as the school was concerned, that led to your suspension? No, no. So, so she waited behind after the class. Um, worried about doing the, the, the test. And in the conversation, she was more worried about getting a bad mark than, than she was about a name being going up on the board. So I said to her, you know, make sure you have a go at this. This will look good on your, on your, your, on your UCAS application. Yeah. You know, I'll work with you over the lunchtime so we can practice. Um, you know, so I did it, you know, laid everything out for her. And then she got really emotional and started crying. I said, is this the transitioning thing that's upsetting you? And she said, yeah. I said, you need to make, be really careful about this. You need to make sure that you understand the risk. It's extremely dangerous, and you make sure that you're not getting pushed into it by anybody else. And uh, and I because you were concerned this was a social contagion, obviously. Yeah, completely. Yeah, yeah. And that she, she that she didn't know what she was doing, and she was getting getting bamboozled into it by by others. So I had that conversation with her, and I said, "Look, you, you know, it's up to you at the end of the day, but make sure you know what you're doing." Um, it's a reasonable to say, it's a reasonable conversation to have, I suppose. Yeah, the position yeah. you're so in. I said to, yeah, so I said to her that um, if things are bad, then the thing that tends to happen to people who are experiencing bad things is that they will tend to comply with the person who is oppressing them. The greater the oppression, uh, the more the oppressed will tr try and comply with the with the oppressor. So I try to give her some some examples of, of that. And um, anyway, she you know, after it was only a five minute conversation, not even a conversation I particularly prepared for. Uh, so she goes away and said, OK, I'll, I'll, um, I'll think about it. I'll think about doing the test and I'll, th I'll think about this uh, transition. And she process. seemed OK when she walked away from that conversation. Yeah, she was obviously, she was obviously upset. But yeah, likewise, I was upset. This is one of my students I'd worked really hard, hard for and really, really hard with. And she was starting to make good progress. She'd, you know, she'd had a tough uh, first year. She, you know, she was on the up. And then suddenly you know, this, this thing come, comes out of the blue. So anyway, so she goes away, as I say, um, uh, you, know, you know, thinking you know, you know, she's going to reflect and, and maybe try and do the test and then um, reflect on, on her decision to pursue this, this ideal that, that she might want to become a boy. She subsequently enters the girls' maths competition as a girl. She does it. It's a voluntary thing. She goes all the way up to the top of maths floor you know, and, and, and enters. So my immediate interpretation of that 
was that she was having second thoughts about being a boy. And, and at any stage, did she raise any other issue about the fact that maybe you were referring to her as she or using her female no, name no. or there was no other no. suggestion? Okay, so you, you had thought no. that maybe she had reflected on her decision and that maybe Correct. there was a change. Yeah. Correct, yeah. And, and, and also the, 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 the other criticism of me in the tribunal was that um, because the safeguarding response was not the response that I wanted. I should have raised it to, to management. But the last thing I wanted to do was raise it to management because in the, in, in, when I had the, uh, the first safeguard, you know, when I had the first meeting with the safeguarding, I asked, can I raise it uh, any higher? And I was told that there was no point. It had already been raised higher and the decision would not be changed. And by this time, you know, the, mm. the stable, you know, she'd already bolted. So my concern is if I raise it further with management, it, they'll just encourage it further along this pathway. It seemed to me that the situation was, was going to blow out and it was just now you know, a case of waiting, waiting for time. So I carry on teaching as per usual. Um, and then the next uh, thing is in January, uh, 23rd of January, I think it was, her friend stays behind after class. And a friend demands that I should refer to her as a he and with, with, with her new name. And then and I try to say to her friend that this is really not very good. Um, you know, it's dangerous. You know, as a friend, what you should be trying to do is encourage her to be reflective. Of it. I said, it's a dangerous thing to do now because I said to her, the world is going into a bad place. This was just before the start of the Ukraine war. And... Um, Mm. And the world is heading into a bad place. And the last thing you want to do is make yourself more dependent on healthcare. And um, so I tried to, and again, in a, in, a, in a short conversation I hadn't prepared for, I tried to lay the ground out and reason with her. And, um, mm. and, and, and she said, well, if you don't do it, I'm going to put a complaint in. I said, okay, we'll put a complaint in. And did you, think she, was good? Did you think she was going to put a complaint in? And the other question I was asking, in hindsight now, on reflection, do you think probably... It should have been a case of maybe you shouldn't have bothered trying to help because it, re it look how it's reflected on your career now at this stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah you, you know, you're absolutely right. I think, yeah, you know, in, in hindsight, I would do the same thing. I would raise a safeguarding concern. My job as a teacher is to teach maths. My other job as a teacher is to make sure safety is is, uh, is paramount in my in my classes. And um, you know, the college should have a safeguarding procedure and policy which is Scott and which I complied with. And um, the college should have done a proper safeguarding investigation. But the criticism that from the tribunal to me is that um, because I wasn't happy with the safeguarding concern, I should have then raised it with management. Because I didn't do so, that's basically why the case has collapsed around me. So they, I they are. They are. Well, I suppose it, the hearing focused very much on the fact that, yeah, and it says it in the hearing, the hearing heard how Lister had wrote the student A's birth name, known as her dead name, on a classroom white white room board during discussion about whether the student should uh, be entering a nationwide uh, girls' maths competition. That they kind of focused very much on that in the hearing, didn't they? That in other yeah, words, you yeah. you in other words, what they tried to suggest or what they're suggesting was you humiliated the student. But from what you're telling me, you believe you didn't humiliate her because you spoke to her afterwards. You had a, it seemed a reasonable conversation with her. She went away. She came back. She entered the maths competition as a girl. So you, you so that didn't seem to be an issue for, from your point of view. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And then and then yeah, the the follow on from that was that I then um, harassed and discriminated by pointing at her rather than using her name. Well. I'm not allowed to use her birth name because I'm going to be dead naming and I don't want to use her new name because I've got no parental consent and, and it's a part of a social transitioning. The college is... If, if you had, sorry sorry for interrupting, but if you had parental consent, for example, if her parents had a visit to the school and said, listen, we, we're aware of this, we've spoken to her about this, uh, she does prefer if you want to, if you could use the new he pronoun and, you know, and a, a male name, would you have done that? Well, I think that you know, the parental view is, is important in a safeguarding issue, no question about it. But the parental view isn't the only um, input that goes into understanding a safeguarding situation. The, the, the you know, parents can, can, can be wrong, and the parental view should have been part of a wider um, safeguarding strategy meeting, where you know, maybe the parents sit down with social services and the college and and, and, and maybe maybe medical professionals and everyone sits down. And if there is a genuine reason why a student needs to be referred to in the in the wrong sex, then yeah, then let's hear it and, let, and let's put it out. But I don't know if a parent comes along and says that you know that I, I want my daughter to be referred to as a he. I don't know what what's behind that parent's decision. Does a you know, has a parent just woken up in the morning 
and 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 fancy changing their daughter from mm. a female to a male. You know, mm. is it a is it a, a, a parent dri driven situation? And certainly in the um, uh, in the Tavistock um, uh, uh, case with uh, Sonia Appleby, then she was making quite clear that a big driver for transitioning of students was parents, was it the, the kind of Munchausen by proxy type type parent situation. And in, in, okay, in relation to the hearing itself, obviously it was a costly manner. I mean, you said you represented yourself because I had to, and not because I wanted to, but the NEW withdrew their support. My insurance company would not pay, and I didn't want to draw down on anyone else. So, in other words, you ended up going into huge financial difficulties yourself because of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And did, did you think, um, in the world we live in today, I, it's bizarre to ask you this question, but did you think you were going to win the gate? Because it looked like you were at a loss from the word go, really, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I, yeah I'm, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not, I'm not a barrister. Yeah, it's a highly complex case. Um, you know, people represent themselves in the employment tribunal normally for things like, you know, you've been fired because, you, 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 you know, for whatever reason, a simple single thing. But this, is, this was much more complicated. I thought I might have a good chance because I thought the facts were... So you know, incontrovertible, in, incontrovertible that you know, there was only one person who made a complaint. That was student B. Student A's voice had never been heard. The um, I'd referred that the the issue to Swinburne Council when I got suspended. I said there's two safeguarding concerns that I'd raised, which haven't been reviewed by the college. So there's this safeguarding concern about student A. There's another concern that I raised about a teacher who was encouraging students to. Um, uh, to, to uh, I, I assume, you know, well, let me be precise about the words. This other teacher, in her words, was directly supporting four transgender students. Well, however, that support was, I, I don't know. So I raised a safeguarding concern about her. Neither of them got, got addressed. So I reported it to the local MASH, the, the multi agency safeguarding hub. They then basically phoned the college and say, here's two safeguarding concerns, make sure you investigate, which the sick college never did. And um, so, 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 uh, and, and the, the Swindon hub had, had recognised the failures of the college's process. They, they said their safeguarding executive said that student A's voice hadn't been heard. So I thought I had a good chance, in as much that the failure of the safeguarding, uh, the failure of the college to manage its safeguarding, put them in an extremely weak position. But that's not the way it works anymore. I mean, what we have is a completely different situation now. What we, you know, what I've learned from from this awful experience is that we now put the Equality Act above safeguarding in our schools. So a student can now basically come along and say, you know, I think I'm 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 uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm transgender because the school's been um, indoctrinating them. They become that that person. They instantly have protected characteristic status. As soon as anybody speaks to that student and says, you know, be careful what you're doing here. That's it. You are speaking to this to the student in a way that's harassing and discriminating and and, uh, and, and not welcome by Ra them. rather than rather than somebody who just cares yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, and so that where does that leave you now i mean i don't know if you can take an appeal against that now or are you planning yeah, to so, take so an appeal against I've, it? I've got yeah lawyers and barristers are looking at, at the, the paperwork to to uh, start pushing a, an appeal forward the problem is if you go for an appeal and if it goes wrong then then the costs then you know, are enormous. It's spiraling you know, at this stage, I imagine. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. I then have to pick up all the costs of the other side. Now I know, I know you do have a GoFundMe, and what we will do at the end of the podcast when we do put it out, actually, we'll put a link up to the GoFundMe as well. But it, so you do have a GoFundMe uh, to try and help you with this because, of course, you're not going to get free legal aid. Uh, you're certainly not going to help get anybody to help you with the costs. And to top of all that, you lost your job, so you can't even I'm get employed as a school it's teacher. More than, it's more than just losing my job. Okay, yeah, I've been referred to the DBS in the UK. We've got the um, D Disclosure and Barring Service. So the college then justified the um, suspension of me on safeguarding grounds that I'd caused emotional harm to a transitioning student. So I've now been referred to the DBS. The DBS is a completely um, woke left wing, or I assume it's run by crazy uh, woke uh, left wingers. It, on the 19th of um, December, they put me on the barred list. So I'm basically on the same level as Ian Huntley and, oh, and all the other pedophiles and, and, and murders. So I can never teach again. So as far as they're concerned, you're a danger to children. That's that's that, right. that's the, the kind of category you're in now. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. does that does that put you in a bad position now, not just as a teacher, but any job that would, that would require, any say, job, vetting? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So I can't work for Tesco's as a van driver because you need DBS clearance for that. 
I can't help out at my local athletics club with, with the kids in, in the competitions every year. You know, the local athletics club has said, you know, sorry, Kev, you know, we don't actually think you're going to be a harm, but you are DBS barred, so don't come anywhere near here. Oh, because you misgendered a student. Oh, because I misgendered, yeah, misgendered a student. Well, really, all because I raised, you know, two safeguarding concerns. Mm. I mean... When we look at this story, I mean, we've seen very similar stories around the world. This is not the first time this happened in the UK, and it also happened in the Isle of Man, and it's happened all across America, and as I said, it's happened here, a slightly different story, but it has happened here as well. Um, do you think going forward, and, and Richie Sunak only just spoke about this going back about five or six months ago, by the way, when he mm. talked, he, he referred to this as being nonsense, this kind of ridiculous idea that, for example, the NHS were using words like pregnant people and all this kind of stuff, and he said we need to go back to, you know, to, to, to grassroots when it comes to this kind of stuff. And he kind of poo-pooed this nonsense, but but yeah, it seems to be getting worse. So if the Prime yeah. Minister of the country is saying, let's stop this nonsense, but yet you're in the situation you're in, where does that fare off? Yeah, it's, 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 it is absolutely crazy. Uh, yeah, the, the, the other thing that I would say as well is we need to step back from, from, from this, you know, from, from the nitty gritty of, 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 um, of, of my, my issue here. And, and, you know, and, and online, on Twitter, everyone, all, all the trolls are all slagging me off and so on and so forth. I mean, I really could, couldn't give a damn even, even uh, re reading their comments. But this is the important thing. You know, let, you know, let's, let's, let's focus on the nub of this and what's happening. This is a massive social experiment, a massive social and medical experiment, the likes of which we have never seen before. You know, this experiment that we come along, we, we, you know, we convince young children that they can be of the opposite sex. A girl can be a boy, a boy can be, can be a girl. In the Kira Bell case, the judgment was clear that this is an experiment. There is no medical evidence at all to back it up or support it. OK, now, where else have we had big experiments, big medical experiments? The last mm -hmm. big medical experiment was in Auschwitz of a similar ethical proportion. And the first attempts to transition children from one sex to another were, t were attempted in Auschwitz. This is what we're talking about. This is the moral depravity that, that we are talking about. And, and, the, and the, the technology today might be better than, than the technology that, that uh, Dr. Josef Mengele had in Auschwitz. But the moral standard, the moral position is about the same. In 1947, after Auschwitz, after the Second World War, the, 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 the international community came together to write the Nuremberg Code. There was a 10-point Nuremberg Code for medical ethics that discussed things like um, consent of a person, discussed things like injury, discussed things like the benefit to, to mankind uh, for, for the experiment being undertaken and so forth. If you compare the trans medical experiment is ongoing now against those 10 points in the Nuremberg Code, it fails every single one of them. By but what, yeah, but what we're seeing now is because, of course, of the advent of social media, um, social media has certainly been a huge player in this because it's almost promoted like some sort of cool thing for kids to do. Um, exactly. and, and, and I think that's particularly sad. Now, there is no doubt that our students out there and I think we all have to be conscious of this, Kevin, who have confusion and get confused about their gender. And, you know, and we've always had that, by the way, since I was in school. You know, there are always got these kids, you know, some boys would be a bit effeminate and some girls may be masculine. In our day, we call them tomboys. Um, but that's all changed. And I only spoke recently to one doctor who said when she was 16 years of age, she was referred to as a tomboy because she wanted to play rugby. She wanted to do what the boys were doing. She used to hang around with her brother's mates. But now she's turned out to be a married woman with four children and has embraced her own femininity. But she said, if this had, if when I was 16, if it had been now, somebody would have encouraged me to change my gender, which could have been drastic. Um, but that's what's happening now. And, and we do have to be very conscious that when we have a child, you know, who is confused about their gender, that they should get support. They absolutely should get support. We should support them in every way they possibly can. But I think what we're doing essentially is socially is we're encouraging children almost to do this. We're not. Yeah, you're absolutely right. We're doing more than encouraging. We're indoctrinating them. So from about the age of five, when kids hit school, you know, they're getting LGBTQ taught to them and indoctrinated into them, you know, from day one until the point when they get to the age of 17, 18, then, uh, then they start moving down this pathway and everyone says, oh, that's great. You know, you can consent now because you're old enough. No, you're not consenting because you're old enough. You've been indoctrinated. You are not making an informed decision. So in, in, uh, in a new college where I was at, you know, I, uh, someone sent me the um, PowerPoint materials that were being used in the RSC educations, and it was all pro-trans. 
there was no discussion at all about the side effects of taking testosterone, its irreversibility, you know, the need for caution, the gender reassignment policy that was at the hub of, of, of my case is completely pro-trans. It even has um, links at the back uh, for, for, you know, for the, the, the staff or students to, to use, which takes you all to transgender lobby groups and tells you about you know, the, the, the benefits of taking testosterone and, and, um, and having, for women ha you know, having a double mastectomy and so forth. You know, there was not one bit of evidence anywhere about the damage that this can do and the irreversibility of it and, and so forth. And what I, you're saying is absolutely right. When I was 17, 18, I was an idiot. I mean, you know, anybody that's, um, that's fallen this, who remembers me from my days, well, no, I was an idiot. You know, yeah, we make mistakes when we're younger. But mm -hmm. what we didn't do was have mistakes that would be irreversible. And we weren't encouraged to, to pursue irreversible mistakes. Well, mind you, that, that has changed somewhat. The NHS have now banned the prescri prescribing puberty blockers. And I know they're talking about trying to get it done in this country too, although there are too many woke politicians in this country as well. But at, at the hearing, by the way, in Bristol, in the Civil Justice Centre, the college, uh, the college's principal and chief executive uh, at the time, Carol Kitchen, said it was the way Lister's gender critical beliefs were manifested that led to the to his dismissal, and not the views himself. So, in other words, that what they were trying to say was they took on board the fact that, that you had a history of maybe being critical uh, in relation to you know gender reassignment or that kind of thing. What do you say to that that accusation? No, I mean it's just, just it's just absolute rubbish what they were saying, and I tried to get that across in the in the tribunal. It didn't seem to go across. So basically what happened was I had that one conversation with student B. So she writes a list of, of everything. So I'm trying to explain to her why she should um, put, you know, temper caution when, when she has uh, the conversations with, with a friend. That then gets used by Charlotte Best as evidence that I've been um, transphobic. There's then a second report done by um, Jane Davidson, who is the, uh, the, the college assistant principal, so she takes each one of the bullet points and says, another student has said this, another student has said that, another student says this, to make it look as if what I had said had been said in front of the classroom. When I, in the cross-examination that I had with um, Lynn Plested, the, um, the, the now deputy principal, I said that you have a vision that I st stood in front of the classroom, wasting valuable mass teaching time, um, pontificating about transgenderism in front of student A. And she kind of mut muttered and said, yes, said, well, where's the evidence? And, and, did, and did you at any stage, Kevin, in front of the whole classroom? And yeah, um, did never. you talk about gender critical theory or anything no, like that? No, not once, ever. And I never would, mm -hmm. ever. And, and when I spoke to student B, I didn't sell, tell student B that I'd raised a safeguarding concern about mm -hmm. student A because I wanted to protect her confidentiality. I didn't raise it with my, with my manager to protect student A's confidentiality. And, and I never raised it in the classroom. The only thing I didn't do was go along with the social transition because it seemed to me her, her request was ambiguous, especially after she entered the, the girls' mass competition. I never raised it in the classroom at all, ever, and certainly did not debate it in front of the classroom in the way that, that, that was um, alleged. Coming back to an earlier question that I asked you, that, that, you know, at any stage, would you be happy enough to, you know, uh, use somebody's gender identity pronoun? You know, what are your thoughts, generally speaking? You know, for example, if you were out or you met somebody or a friend or you were out for dinner, and somebody asked you to refer to them as a pronoun that you knew that they weren't biologically assigned. Um, would you use the pronoun? Probably not, no, because it, it depends. I mean, it, it's, that's a bit, very much as a depends situation. Mm. Um, but, you know, my gut I, I, I know we don't get to use pronouns. I mean, I already said this some of the other day. Generally, we don't use pronouns unless it's in the yeah. third party anyway. Well, yeah. You know. Well, there's, I can't think of any circumstance where, where I would be, you know, out, out socially and meet, you know, meet friends where I would tell anybody how to speak and how to think. And, and I, I would pretty much have the same response back if somebody asked me to do the same. I say, yeah, you know, thank you. I understand, you know, that, that you know you you want to compel me how to how to speak, but really, you know, what I'm seeing in front of me is a guy, not a girl, or a girl, not a guy, and uh, you know, with respect, I would rather uh, you know, speak to you in the way that I feel most appropriate. I don't think anybody should be allowing anybody, um, you know, I don't think anybody should be allowed to compel somebody how to speak and what to say. You know, therein lies the pathway to totalitarianism. You know, when, well, one one of the things that I have to show. Um, in court was that um, that I didn't believe that what they were doing was, was a, a legitimate mean to a, or a proportionate um, um, mean to a legitimate aim. And one of the things that they said that the legitimate aim was to allow people to express their identity in the class. 
Well, I've had people with all sorts of identities in my class. I've had Goths, I've had punks, I've had Muslims, I've had Hindus, I've had, you know, and, 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 and the class gets enriched for people with different ideas and things. Mm -hmm. But never have I had somebody with a personal identity which they inflict upon everybody else and expect everybody else to validate. So it's, it's, it's it, you know, that, that's what... Well, no, no, I, I, I've explained this to people in the past. For example, if you had a Muslim in your class, there's no way you would, you would accept if that Muslim demanded everybody believed in Allah, for example. They can believe in Allah and you would respect that they yeah. believe in Allah, but yeah. they don't demand that everybody else do it at the same time. Uh, going forward for you now, I mean, the situation you're in is a desperate situation. You can't be a teacher. You can't get any job that needs vetting uh, whatsoever because you're now considered to be a danger to children just because you wouldn't accept the gender identity of a child or a minor um where, where does that leave you now kevin uh so um we're going to look at, at, at an appeal um I, I don't know if i can stomach an appeal at the moment i, I need to make sure you know, i've got the finances in, in place. There's a lot a huge number of people come come to me with support um and, and quite substantial um uh, sums of money but i'm not going to pursue it unless there's really really good 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 grounds to do so um, I want to challenge in court the DBS ruling. Um, we, so we've got the paperwork into the upper tribunal to, to, to appeal the DBS ruling. What I'm also doing as well um, is oh, I, I, I'm involved with the Bad Law Project now, and I'm the lead witness for a judicial review that the Bad Law Project has is, is, uh, is, is started against the Department for Education. Uh, so in the UK, we've got the Education Act, Section 406 and 407, but the, the two important uh, sections of that. Section 406 bans the teaching of, of, um, of, of politically partisan topics, and Section 407 mandates that, that the teaching is, is balanced. So what we argue is that the introduction of the gender ideology in, into schools is in violation of both 406 and 407 of the Education Act, and, and that it was done deliberately. This didn't happen by mistake. You know, this was a deliberate thing that happened with, in conjunction with the Department for Education to bring this ideology into schools. And there's an extremely strong audit trail um, as, as to, as yeah, to well, I, 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 find, I find it quite bizarre, actually, that particularly here in Ireland and England, not so much because, of course, there's always been a great mix of different religions and ethoses. But in Ireland, as you know, we would have a Catholic ethos in this country primarily. And yet we've yeah. spent the last 10 or 15 or 20 years trying to remove the indoctrination of Catholic ethos from schools because 85% of our schools are Catholic schools. And we're trying to remove that ethos. And slowly but surely we're doing it. And by the way, I have no ob objection to people's religions. Um, you know, if you want to do it after school or at home, absolutely. Uh, and they should embrace their religion if that's what they want to do. But we're trying to remove that ethos or that indoctrination. And yet we're now replacing it with another indoctrination. And we're, we're having yeah, the yeah. same difficulty here because they're now changing the curriculum in Ireland. They've already changed it for a junior cycle or or A-levels, as it would be, or B-level, whatever it is in the UK. Um, I'm not too sure what they call the junior cert in the United Kingdom. Um, but the 15, 16-year-olds. Um, and now they want to introduce it next year into primary level education, where they bring in gender ideology, or as you, as you call it, gender ideology, or t gender teaching in the curriculum for primary school children. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely unbelievable. And, and you know, you, you know, the, the, you know, Ireland's history of the, of the um, oppression that it, it suffered with the Catholic Church is a terrible thing. It's a ter it makes terrible, terrible, painful reading. And I've read much on it. And um, but what we're doing in the UK and in Ireland is, you know, we're allowing this ideology into schools, which is far worse than uh, than, than, than than Catholicism. Yeah, you know, it, 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 you know, the, with Catholicism, you didn't, we weren't pushing kids to take in cross sex hormones. These drugs are easily available online. I mean, any, you can buy them anywhere for tough and safety. You know, you can, you know, a young, a young female can easily take all the testosterone she needs in a year for, for not much more than a pocket money. This is easy. And easy these to drugs can, can be irreversible, can cause problems with bone density, can cause sterility. Uh, they can yeah. cause a lot of problems. And it's something that you really need to think about before you do it. And I would absolutely say the same thing, Kevin. Kevin, it's been a very interesting conversation. Uh, I'd like to keep up with you and let's see how you get on. I do wish yeah. you well, and I know many people do. Uh, you've got a mixed reaction on social media. Primarily people supporting you, actually, I have to say, from what I've seen. But there has been a mixed reaction. How are you handling the negative reaction? It's just what, what, what it is. I mean, I never block anybody. You know, people say block, block, you block people, block people. You know, if, if people want to slag me off, that's, that's fine. It's a free country. And if they want, you know, if they want to, you know, you know, claim that I'm a child abuser or a bully or a harasser, then yeah, stick your name up. I don't really care. Um, it's watered off a, off a duck's back to me. 
Um, have you have you been harassed personally yourself? I mean, I, I, I get the usual death threats yeah. and things coming coming through. Um, mm. I've, I've not had anyone pitching up at the door trying to beat me up at, at anything yet. And how, how are you? By the way, I didn't ask, but how are you? I mean, how are you as a person holding up through all this? Because it's very difficult yeah, yeah. to hold up through negativity I'm, like this. No, thanks. That's a really, that's a really good question. It's been. I can't tell you how how emotionally tough this has been on me. Um, it's it's tough on me. Um, personally, you know, losing my career. And I really love teaching. I would go back and I'd teach them nothing tomorrow. Um, you, know, you know, get me in a classroom, teach them maths, and, and, and that's mm. all I want to do. You know, I don't really yeah. want to do much of this in life. Uh, so, so, you know, loss of, of that is, is, is bad. But to be quite frank, the, 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 the thing that has just torn me to pieces is what, is what has happened to my student, to student A. I cannot believe that she went into this voluntarily. Yeah, you know, yeah. You know, it seems to me that she got pushed and cajoled into this by everybody around her, and you know, other than me, I don't see that there's any evidence that of anybody um, listening to her voice and saying, you know, just be careful about what you're doing here. And when um, you spoke, when you spoke to her, see, so you would have a better idea than probably most because you did speak to her honestly in relation to it. Um, well, yeah. look, as I said, I wish you well, and I, and I hope you get through this because it is a very difficult time, particularly when people are piling on like that. And I know you've you've been on media, you've been on different TV stations, radio stations talking about your case. I'm sure you're sick talking about it at this stage, and maybe you just want a bit of time out from it all at this stage. Yeah, that's basically yeah, that's what I'm doing, and you know, going out for a bike ride and reading, catching up on some books. I started a mass problem about three years ago. Um, on, it was a climate change related mass problem, which I worked on for about two years, and I put it all to one side and dusting that back off. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, keep it, your mind it busy. Be, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It might be time for me to move my brain onto 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 other things. But I wrote a book many many years ago, and one of the things I it made me so sensitive about this. It was the book was on climate change. Um, it's called the Vortex of Violence and why we're losing the war on climate change. And I was looking at what was the chance of making a successful agreement on climate change. And works out at six times 10 to the minus 63 and work it out through um, a game theory analysis. So virtually nothing. That's less than the chance of finding a single atom from all the atoms that, that make the planet. And one of the things that occurred to me was that as climate change gets worse, competition will increase. And we'll have to convince you know, more and more. We'll have to do the things that we know that we shouldn't do. We'll have, we'll have to burn mm -hmm. more fossil fuels, fight harder. Uh, when we know that that's absolutely the wrong thing to do. And what I said then, what I speculated on then, was that we would enter into a phase of collective schizophrenia. And I can't help but think that this is part of that collective schizophrenia. I, I, I was talking to somebody about this the other day, and, and I'm an atheist, right? I don't, I don't believe in God, but I do respect people's religion. And do you think that the fall off in the belief of a religion um, you know, particularly for young people, those people primarily, I suppose, between the age of 16 and 30 years of age, that the fact that they don't have something to follow, i.e. they're not following a religion or a god or whatever it is, um, do you think it's because, because of that they want to follow something else? So the next thing will be climate change or the next thing will be veganism or the next thing will be gender identity or the next thing will be... So in other words, they always have, so, have to have something to be part of something. Is, is that... Re am I wrong in thinking that? Yeah, I, th I think it's a really, really, really good analogy that, that you've made. I'm, I'm like you. I'm a, I'm a born again and committed atheist. Uh, and um, but I think having a moral, the moral framework of religion is very, very beneficial to to to, to people. But again, uh, you know, to talking about trying to belong to something, um, young people that I was teaching were really bright, really switched on. I mean, it was a real pleasure to be in the classroom with them, and they would have. Uh, you, know, you know, quite often, you know, really good discussions at the end of the class or even within classes about yeah. topics of concern. One, one of which was regularly was climate change because they knew, they knew I, I was uh, heavily involved with with, with uh, in, in climate change um, issues, and they were they were on the ball. They they knew that this was going to make their life crap when they grew up, and they were terrified by it. In 2010, when um, it's sort of mandated in the UK schools that an inconvenient truth was to be shown to everybody. There was a palpable sense of change in, in student atmosphere and students' behavior after that, that they realized that the future was going to be tough and hard. And, and there was that despondency. And then sort of climate activism came along and the schools had to include sustainability on the, on the curriculum. And then it reached a pinnacle with, with Greta Thunberg and the, and the school strikes. 
And then I not, wouldn't be I wouldn't be a fan of Greta. I'm going to be, I'm okay, going to be, a, but, to be honest. Yeah, with you. That's fine. Okay, but but you know, she was a young person speaking up for for young people. It's easy for us, you know, yeah. you know as more, more elderly gentlemen to to you know to, to pontificate and, and to and to critique. But the point was the point I'm making is that young people were doing the best that, that, that they could at that time to, to raise their voice on climate change. And they can see the ship around them is starting to break up and sink. And they'll look into the future in panic. And then suddenly nothing happens at all. And what they, what they left with? Well, well, then along comes a transgender uh, idea. So climate change is black and bleak and dark when you look at that. And, and you know, I know because I spent a lot of time looking mm. at, in detail at the mathematics behind climate change. And it, it is hugely stressful, hugely dark, and, and, and it, it, it presents a, a future of constraints and restriction to, to everybody. Then along comes transgender with its rainbows and its idea that you can be anything you want to be, and all you can be, you can be, you can be yourself. It's such a wonderful contrast to that dark message that has been infused into students. Yeah. Oh, you know, for, for, for a long period of time. So, the, you know, the combination of that made it easy uh, for the trans ideology to, 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 you know, to get traction in schools. And, and then along comes the, the, uh, the, the huge explosion of social media. So it's like a perfect storm, all sorts of things happening at once together. And I, I think so it's so unfair really on young people. Eh? I mean, we, we've been very unfair on young people. Look, we, when we were kids, we didn't have much to deal with. Apart from which was your favourite band, Pink Floyd, Queen, or whoever it happened, ACDC. Uh, but nowadays, students have so much to contend with because we're kind of bombarding them with all this stuff. And they kind of have to pick something to be part of something, you know, because everybody else is part of something. And that's why I mentioned at the very start of this, particularly in the United Kingdom, we're seeing, you know, certain schools will have a lot of children who will be changing their identities, whereas other schools have none at all. And, and it is, you know, a contagion within the school. Um, but look... It is what it is, and you are where you are, and it's a very difficult situation you find yourself in, Kevin, and I do wish you well, and on a personal level, I wish you well too, and I hope you're dealing with it well. Uh, and we look forward to hearing you from the future, hopefully successful in your appeal, by the way. And if people want to support you or want to follow you, they can find you online, uh, Kevin Lister. Um, and uh, we will put a link up as well on our profile too. To your, I know you have a GoFundMe there at the moment to try and help you with the cost of this because nobody else is helping you with the cost. Kevin, thank you very much indeed for joining us, and I appreciate okay. it. And yeah, I wish you thank well. you for having me on. Okay, been superb.